Hello, my name is Suzanne Herring, and it's my pleasure to be here today with Professor Juan Fernanda de la Mora of Yale University. And yet, Juan is one of the outstanding, more imaginative leaders in aerosol science. But uh, so we're here today to discuss how he charted his way through this career in aerosol science and to see if he has any new brilliant ideas for us. So Juan, let's just start at the beginning. And when you were at Yale, your thesis was strictly theoretical, full of equations. Indeed. And you've come to be an experimentalist. How did this transition happen? Well, before I answer that question, I'd like to uh, say that I, I'm really pleased that uh, you, uh, in your busy schedule, uh, were able to uh, uh, take care of this uh, interview. It's, uh, it's uh, wonderful. Uh, I started uh, 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 receiving your influence uh, very early on in my career, and I, this uh, question is, is most appreciated. Uh, it's true that uh, uh, being a theorist that has great advantages. You can sort of shift uh, around uh, uh, from one field to the other. And uh, uh, I started as an aeronautical engineer, and uh, through uh, things which were unpredictable, uh, such as uh, uh, who offers you a job position, I ended up joining Dan Rosner at Yale, uh, uh, who was the only one who sort of uh, had enough trust on uh, my not very impressive uh, 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 grades as, a, as a, an engineer. And uh, so I ended up in, a, in a, the university in the chemical engineering department, which was most unexpected because I was myself a, a, an aeronautical engineer. And uh, his interest at the moment were aerosol uh, science. Uh, and uh, it was far from aeronautics, but uh, I enjoyed it very much from the beginning. And my thesis was strictly theoretical. And there were some very interesting predictions uh, uh, which uh, came about through the influence of, uh, of another great uh, Yale uh, scientist, John Fenn, uh, whom you know well. Uh, and uh, we were studying the inertia of, uh, of uh, small particles. And John used to come to the student seminars. Uh, and uh, uh, he pointed out to me some work that he had done in the past in which uh, there were, uh, uh, he, he claimed that uh, heavy molecules uh, like, uh, well, I don't know, xenon in, in a helium uh, uh, jet would exhibit inertial effects. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I read his work. And I found it very attractive from the beginning, but eventually I convinced myself that it was nonsense and that that couldn't be true, which was exactly the viewpoint that everybody had. Uh, but then eventually, on further thought, I realized how uh, in fact, uh, his uh, uh, ideas, uh, uh, he was a very intuitive man uh, with a, uh, an outstanding uh, prediction ability, some sort of a intuitive computer in his mind. And so that got me interested on the inertial separation of extremely tiny objects uh, like uh, uh, molecules. And uh, uh, I found that uh, uh, fascinating. And there were only two groups in the world that uh, practiced that uh, kind of thing. Uh, and uh, it, it was in Germany, and, uh, and they actually were uh, uh, the, the, the chief of that group was um, Becker. And they were separating uranium isotopes uh, in, by using UF6 in hydrogen mixtures at Mach numbers of order one. Uh, and in fact, the kinds of predictions that we had was that indeed you need large mass disparity, helium or hydrogen, at sonic or supersonic velocities, at Reynolds numbers in the order of 10. And so I was uh, really eager to uh, test whether this uh, would uh, work. And the consequence was, of course, that if you could separate molecules, you could easily separate particles of a few nanometers in diameter. But no one was interested in testing uh, that uh, 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 prediction. And so I, I was lucky enough to join Sheldon Friedlander's uh, laboratory, where I met you. You were uh, the soul of that uh, laboratory. And uh, uh, you sort of encouraged me to try to do that uh, uh, experiment. Uh, and uh, in fact, you came and visited uh, when I was at Yale uh, uh, shortly after. And, uh, but even uh, before that, uh, uh, Brett Halpern, uh, 
was a tremendous experimentalist uh, at Yale. Yes, um, contrary to most other people, thought that perhaps it was not impossible to turn me onto a, a, a not a great experimentalist, but at least good enough to do that experiment. And so that was my beginning into the study of inertial effects in uh, 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 gas particle mixtures. And that eventually led to interested impactors uh, in, in, the, in the size range of particles and in air of relevance to aerosol flow. So that's really how I got uh, uh, into doing experiments. So. And so we, we enticed you with the need of uh, those experimentalists, if I enticed you with the need to uh, actually see your ideas come to life in the lab. Well, that came naturally. Uh, <laughs> I mean, even a pure theorist uh, 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 feels that need. Uh, okay. He hopes that uh, a colleague, uh, an experimental colleague, would do the experiment. Uh, but uh, when uh, that colleague doesn't uh, exist, then sort of he comes out of his way uh, to train himself uh, uh, moderately, as, as little as possible, uh, as an <laughs> experimentalist. But once you get the taste uh, of experiments, it's pretty hard. To give it up, and and then you moved you moved on from inertial separation of small particles to mobility separation of small particles, electrical mobility separation, and so you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yes, yeah. uh, uh, um, for almost ten years I was kind of obsessed with uh, with the uh, uh, inertia of the tiny particles. Uh, and then at some point, uh, my uh, 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 dear colleague and actually my PhD thesis advisor, Dan Rosner, uh, uh, tremendously creative uh, a scientist, uh, he used to teach the uh, transport course. And uh, when he went on sabbatical, I inherited his course. I was asked uh, by his chair. I was in mechanical engineering, he was in chemical. And so I taught uh, his uh, uh, course. And uh, well, one of the things that I had learned uh, uh, during my thesis from uh, uh, an illustrious uh, Spanish theorist, uh, Amable Lignan, who, uh, who had a great influence in, 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 in my work as a theorist, uh, was the method of characteristics to account for diffusive effects in problems with flow and, uh, and uh, well, we could also include uh, inertia and convection and so forth. And so I used the techniques which I had learned from Lignan to and calculate the, what was the, uh, uh, the performance of a DMA, and I su was surprisingly, uh, 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 I surprisingly discovered that it was an optimal length of a DMA, and uh, this was incidentally a homework problem which I assigned uh, uh, <laughs> to my students, uh, uh, some of whom actually uh, managed to do some progress, uh, uh, and uh, now that prediction. Uh, sort of stunned me that, uh, 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 that uh, uh, the existing uh, DMAs, that uh, uh, the KSI model, which we had, uh, the ratio of the gap between the electrodes to the length may have been, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 or, or 50, while the optimal theoretically, theoretically was one. Uh, and it made sense because if it's, a, uh, if it's zero distance, of course, everybody goes uh, out at the same voltage. And if it's very long, you have a lot of time to diffuse. So that made sense. And so again, uh, I didn't have any equipment uh, to do that experiment, um, but um, I was very eager to test it. Uh, and uh, I met Andreas Schmidt Ott in, uh, in a conference uh, one of those years, maybe the late, uh, the late 80s. Uh, spent, I'd spent three years in Spain. Uh, and Andreas did two things. He invited me to Duisburg to uh, run this experiment. So in a DMA, which they had, and they made it shorter. It was a racial type of uh, uh, DMA. And he also gave me a, a racial type DMA, which we exchanged by uh, uh, an impactor, the kind they had developed. Uh, he was interested in merging the fractal dimension. And so, to make the long story short, I visited Duisburg. Uh, we tried that uh, uh, short instrument with molecules, and it didn't work. <laughs> and uh, so we went, went back to uh, uh, New Haven, and you had the drawings of a racial DNA. Uh, 
uh, or or you, I don't remember the details. So actually, he told me that I could write Reichel and he would send them. But uh, one way or the other, we actually got the drawings and we yeah, had the prototype. You, you would have gotten those from George. And probably, because he certainly was uh, gave it uh, freely to anyone who uh, provided it, uh, who requested it. Uh, and so I had a student, and when he was uh, Rosel, and when he heard that uh, Schmidt Ott and I had failed with the DMA uh, experiment, he told me that. Um, if I gave him a few months, he would do that experiment and it would work. And we had an, uh, an NSF uh, project, so we had the funds. I gave him the go ahead. He built his short racial DMA and it worked um, uh, beautifully. Yeah. <laughs> and one day I met uh, George Reichel and told him, But how is it that this uh, uh, DMA at Duisburg didn't work and the other DMA at uh, Yale did work? And he told me, Come on, I mean, don't you know? No, I don't know. The DMA at Duisburg is a copy of someone who didn't ask for my drawings and who used the published uh, sketches. Which <laughs> had nothing to do with the real incident. And of course, that thing didn't work. <laughs> so the merit, of course, was the drawings. It was not. Uh, 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 and so uh, uh, that's how we got uh, started into uh, uh, um, DMA work. And what was particularly useful and, and very helpful uh, that uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, permitted that we went a little further beyond what uh, George Reichel had done, which was, was great, uh, was the fact that John Fenn was my colleague. And John Fenn had, a few years before, invented electrospray. And electrospray turned out to be a tremendous tool to put in the gas phase relatively large ions, uh, which were completely monodispersed. And so that didn't exist for uh, aerosol instruments, uh, uh, I guess in any size range. Uh, yeah. you know, I mean, we could get uh, things with perhaps like two or three percent uh, 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 width, but these ions were infinitely sharp. They were just exactly monomobile. And so you had a way of measuring how bad your DMA was. Uh, and, uh, and with that feedback, they got obsessed. Uh, actually, Rick Reagan had a lot of influence on that obsession. He always uh, in, in, encouraged me to search the higher resolving power, uh, the better, and 100 was not enough, and, and uh, I'm very grateful for these, uh, for these insights. And so that's how we got uh, into, uh, into DMA work. And of course, I had the right background, and because I, I was an aeronautical engineer, I, I had seen wind tunnels, I knew that the key to keep the flow laminar at Reynolds number, which could be huge. In fact, Reynolds, in his early work, uh, had published uh, Stable uh, 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 laminar flows at Reynolds numbers of thirty thousand, and so it, it was not a particularly uh, difficult, uh, but uh, it, it was like very enjoyable. Uh, so, so the uh, development of uh, your DMA work and the ion standards came together. These monomobility ion standards that are just used around the world now. That those developments came together, but you also did additional work uh, coupling this to, uh, uh, or at least evaluating those mo mobility standards with the mass spectrometer. Uh, well, the mass spectrometer uh, work, uh, uh, of course, the use of the DMA uh, for particle analysis uh, was very well established, uh, and uh, uh, it's an instrument that uh, uh, was not widely used uh, by physical chemists or analytical chemists just because the size range uh, didn't match. Uh, uh, but uh, the person who really uh, initiated the connection between aerosol science and, and biological work and, and so more analytical chemistry work was Stan Kaufman uh, mm -hmm. uh, of TSI who sort of put together a system in which the uh, uh, high charge of electrospin would in are important proteins and viruses and in all kinds of biological species would be reduced to unity. And so now the charge the var variable would disappear from the picture and a measurement of mobility would give you the signs. Uh, and uh, so I was uh, very impressed uh, by uh, uh, Stan's work. In fact, I had myself tried to work with proteins before that uh, because that was the exciting thing that John Fenn uh, uh, had done. Uh, but it was not so easy to uh, to achieve correctly the, the, the charge reduction, and David Pui uh, sort of uh, helped in that uh, 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 process. And so 
once uh, Stan uh, had uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, impressed the analytical uh, world on the possibility of using DMAs, we sort of uh, uh, extended it into the smaller sizes which we could handle uh, with uh, our uh, uh, DMAs. And uh, uh, the first name patent on, on high Reynolds number DMAs, which is sort of a very simple patent, it's uh, a DMA run at a Reynolds number greater than 2000, which is sort of a critical uh, uh, value. So we just patented DMAs that did already exist that were not <laughs> run under that uh, uh, that regime. So we started studying clusters, uh, and uh, and uh, of course the key to apply this to mass spectrometer was making parallel plate uh, DMAs uh, because the electrospray source is very intense in terms of uh, of uh, charge density, and the the speed of uh, Spatial uh, 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 opening up of your of your spray plume, maybe ten meters per second, uh, and so in the time in which you advance one centimeter at the characteristic uh, flow rates, you have lost uh, ninety nine point ninety nine percent of your sample. And uh, in a cylindrical DMA, because you have a, 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 a round uh, slit, it just takes a long time to travel around and get everywhere here. And so, in the parallel plate DMA, you can put your source a tenth of a millimeter away from the from the inlet, and so you can transmit uh, uh, twenty or thirty nanoamps of the of the electrospray rather than the twenty or thirty femtoamps, which was uh, what you could do before. And so, that also was very efficiently that parallel plate was also very efficiently coupled uh, to a mass spectrometer, and so it was a marvelous uh, uh, combination. For cluster studies, and we discovered uh, all kinds of uh, idiotic things so with uh, neutral evaporation. The, your DMA would select a cluster, and then when you, you would get to the mass spectrometer, you had that cluster, but another one which had one or two or three molecules so of here. And you would start with something which had three charges on the DMA, and by the time it got to the mass spectrometer, it had two or one. <laughs> and so <laughs> you could measure the kinetics of, uh, of this uh, 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 single event. So, uh, 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 it turns out that you couldn't measure them very well uh, in, uh, in the mass spectrometer because the thermodynamic uh, state in the, in, in, the, in, in the vacuum system of a mass spectrometer is not defined. But you could study these things in, in tandem uh, DMA, so uh, we're kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, it was a rich uh, field. And uh, I should say that, uh, uh, of course, physical chemists tend to uh, uh, not be impressed uh, at this moment by the DMA yet, because they have tools in which the resolving power, instead of being uh, 50 or 100, which is the best that we've ever gotten with a, with a DMA, more 50 than 100, but 100 is possible, they can achieve 200, 300 uh, with, uh, with uh, high mobility uh, spectrometry uh, instruments. Uh, but uh, a year ago, there was the centennial of the quadrupole, or uh, I don't remember exactly what anniversary. Uh, in the American Society of Mass Spectrometry, we had a special symposium on that anniversary. And uh, I was stunned to discover the quadrupole mass spectrometer is a filter, an ion filter, yes. which passes only one mass over charge, which is very much the same thing that the uh, uh, DMA does. Yes. It doesn't do that uh, with the highest resolving power. For instance, time of flight mass uh, spectrometers have resolving powers of 100,000. Yes. The quadrupole may have a resolving power of uh, uh, like 100 uh, or sometimes less, single mass uh, resolving yeah. power. But in fact, it's not an instrument on the way to extinction by <laughs> any means, uh, because it does something that is extremely valuable, which is you select a beam of something, and there it is. You can play with it uh, for hours. You can uh, modify it, as in the tandem the DMAs uh, work that uh, uh, McMurray and, uh, and, and, and Rader uh, uh, developed, and uh, uh, so that kind of a possibility, uh, 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 I think, would make uh, uh, DMA a unique tool, which eventually will end up being adopted uh, very seriously by uh, by uh, uh, chemists and analytical chemists and well as physical chemists, because you can at atmospheric pressure do spectroscopy on uh, on uh, 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 purified uh, uh, molecules and. Uh, uh, it's been widely used by uh, people who are interested in other aerosol uh, things like uh, 
CMC, for instance. Uh, how do you yeah. challenge uh, the CMC? In fact, I'm, I'm very well, pleased to see that uh, you're a, a, an <laughs> adopter of, uh, of our, uh, our high resolution so, DMAs uh, to do these uh, yeah. great so, things so that you're doing with water uh, CPCs. So. Well, so let me let me sort of segue to that topic here and uh, say that you've got this vision of all the, the use for uses for these high resolution small particle DMAs, but there has been over the last few years especially this revolution in condensation particle counters that detect particles in the one, two, three nanometer size range, which has just never been there before. And all of these instruments, every single one of them, is calibrated using your DMA and your ion standards. And so it's become the state of the art. So how did you manage uh, to, uh, or why is it that this technology now populates the nanometer uh, Laboratories well, uh, around the world. That that is that is a very interesting uh, 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 story. I should say that not all, because uh, uh, <laughs> as you know, George Reichel was the early uh, developer. Uh, uh, I, I I didn't discuss that then, but of course the key to be able to run a, um, an aerodynamic instrument at very high Reynolds numbers is a very good aerodynamic design. And uh, George's uh, first uh, uh, the Reichel DMA or the Vienna DMA, as people call it. Uh, has essentially all the uh, all of the elements of our dynamic design, which is good screens at an accelerated flow, a way to stabilize the mixing region where the aerosol flow mixes with a, which is unstable. It's it's a it's a it's a shear layer, and uh, some of the most interesting uh, work on the nano size uh, CPCs done in Vienna was yes. done with with a Reichel uh, uh, DNA. But uh, I'll tell you the story. Because uh, at, at least as I as I entered into it, uh, I had zero experience uh, with uh, 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 CNCs. I always thought they were fascinating uh, instruments. I, I had visited Peter McMurray's. I had seen some wonderful things that he was doing there. But uh, at some point, uh, I was recently married, so it must have been ninety four or ninety five. So, uh, Kikuo Okuyama uh, invited me to spend a month at uh, in uh, Hiroshima. And uh, I didn't know what to uh, what would be the optimal way of collaborating, and so I read, uh, asking for a list of publications that he sent me, and there were lots of fascinating things that he had done. But in particular, I saw that uh, he had this uh, uh, particle size magnifier, which they had developed, uh, uh, and uh, uh, which was based on a turbulent mixing uh, uh, CPC, which was originally developed uh, in Russia, and. Uh, I immediately uh, thought that the, the best uh, uh, joint project that we would do is I would bring that EMA and we would sort of marry the CNC uh, or his uh, PSM, as, as he called it, the particle size magnitude, and would challenge it with, um, with uh, molecules. And I was very concerned that, of course, uh, we wouldn't be able to see anything uh, because mm -hmm. everyone was sort of uh, hang on, on, on the theory that. Uh, Below three nanometers, it was impossible to detect anything. And then the amazing thing that we discovered almost on the first day that we tried it is that their uh, CPC or whatever you call it uh, uh, was able to see not the monomer of uh, uh, tetraheptyl ammonium, uh, 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 but the dimer of tetraheptyl ammonium bromide, which was 1.4 or 1.5 nanometers in diameter, or even less if you subtract the, the diameter of the, of the gas molecule. And so that opened, so opened our eyes. And uh, at the beginning, of course, the explanation was that these guys were charged. Mm -hmm. and, um, um, and in fact, <laughs> a little uh, hindsight you go back to the early work of, of uh, Atkin or, 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 or Wilson, and they were seeing ions of almost zero dimension. So, yes. and, 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 and there were actually papers uh, by El Chal in which in a, in a, a, a diffusion chamber, in a cloud diffusion chamber, with a laser they were producing ions of benzene and, and, and small organic molecules, and they were seeing them activated. And so it was really no surprise uh, the problem why these things haven't been seen before is because they were lost as they entered. 
uh, into the into the DME. And the PSM was a particularly good instrument because it had reasonable flow rates, uh, and, and so these very tiny objects uh, were able to uh, uh, to enter. And so, but at that moment, uh, we had the notion that uh, uh, the Thomson theory explained why you would see these small things, uh, but. Uh, Almost everyone uh, was obsessed by the, uh, or, or sort of uh, uh, under the impression that the condition for critical activation was either the Kelvin limit for neutrals or the Thomson limit uh, for uh, uh, charged particles. But in fact, that was incorrect, and it was known in the literature before, and it was uh, uh, a great paper in which. Uh, um, uh, the Vienna group, uh, 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 Wagner and Winkler, got together with uh, uh, Kulmala, a group in Finland, mm -hmm. and so they reminded uh, 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 the world that there was this vector theory in which, since there is a finite activation energy, and this thermal energy can actually climb a barrier, and theoretically you could see much smaller uh, particles. And that was quite revolutionary because before it was clear that it was impossible to activate a la Thompson ions smaller than a certain size. But uh, the possibility to activate even smaller things because you could jump over a finite barrier uh, uh, made it possible to detect neutral objects of dimensions perhaps uh, less than a nanometer. Uh, uh, and, I mean, that's an area which is not fully developed because we don't have the techniques to introduce controlled pure species um, uh, uh, of uh, uh, size selected without charging them before. And the, the operation of charging sort of complicates. Uh, 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 you add an ion and you remove it, and so you don't know what you have yeah. after with. But you approximately know uh, what yeah. you have. But, uh, and so, so we entered into that field. I had a brilliant student, uh, uh, Gamero, who rapidly realized that uh, uh, the prejudice that we had uh, uh, that uh, um, the operation of the PSM was adiabatic and perfect uh, uh, was not. Uh, uh, in fact, I, s I was visiting uh, uh, Japan for a second time, uh, and I told him uh, strictly that he shouldn't touch that instrument and he should start studying ions in a systematic fashion. And as soon as I left for Japan, he did exactly the opposite. <laughs> he started inserting thermocouples, uh, and uh, and he realized that the thing was not adiabatic, uh, and so he immediately made a few changes, and uh, in a week or two he was able to detect ions with no size limit uh, in in, huh. in very much the same PSM uh, uh, tetra methyl ammonium, which was the smallest uh, thing that we had, which of course was not surprising because El Shal and uh, and, uh, and and and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Wilson and so forth had done it. Uh, uh, in the past, but it still was charged, and uh, so that was essentially my uh, my participation in that uh, uh, field, and uh, I was kind of happy uh, to see that um, um, others followed. Uh, Peter McMurray made some marvelous things with diffusion uh, instruments. Uh, um, Kulmala uh, uh, developed uh, is a uh, marvelous. Uh, uh, um, you came with water. Water is, uh, according to theory, uh, the most uh, uh, exciting uh, uh, material um, because the characteristic uh, 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 parameter that determines the smallest particle that you can detect under neutral conditions scales with the surface tension of the KT, the square root of mm -hmm. that is, is, uh, uh, dimension. And except with liquid metals, there's no way you can beat uh, 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 water. And uh, um, People had some uh, problems with water, which you brilliantly uh, solved uh, in your in your water uh, design, which is still uh, uh, a diffusion uh, 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 device. Uh, but uh, um, water has this uh, uh, um, sort of uh, I like you, I don't like you. Uh, yeah. If you are hydrophobic, I'm sorry, I won't activate you. Yes. And uh, one of the most exciting things in this meeting is your article. Your, your poster showing that negative water or negative ions uh, would be activated by water even if they're highly hydrophobic, hydrophobic uh, like uh, the tetraheptyl ammonium. So that, that's, uh, uh, this is an exciting field. Uh, every year there are new uh, uh, things. And my dream in, in, in this field is to see a very fast uh, uh, CPC, 
milliseconds uh, at most, uh, or perhaps uh, um, four or five milliseconds, with um, a sharp redefined supersaturation, like in the expansion chamber of, uh, of the Vienna group, and uh, uh, which will be sort of more practical in terms of usage so that everybody could uh, carry it in his, uh, in his hand. So I hope I get uh, some funding uh, for an instrument like that, and perhaps your help <laughs> in putting it uh, to work with water. Well, I, I would, uh, I mean, certainly you've encouraged me down this path for some time. <laughs> and and uh, another person that you've worked with very closely is Michelle Atui. And he laid down the same challenge to me earlier this summer, actually. But why don't you talk well, I'm, about I'm very Michelle. happy that you bring uh, uh, Michelle Atui. The, the history of the, of the uh, I've told you about the scientific side of this uh, DMA uh, development, but of course the industrial side or the or the sort of uh, having some usable instrument that uh, uh, people can, without spending enormous time, uh, put to work, is very important. And it's unfortunate that the, our supercritical DMAs. Uh, have not been commercialized. No. But and, they're everywhere. And so, but they were not everywhere until Michel Atui got involved. No. Uh, and uh, Michel Atui uh, was introduced to me by Andrea Schmidt Ott, who's been a friend uh, forever. And uh, um, he sort of learned all the tricks of running his DNA. And it was him, with the exception of, uh, of Peter McMurray, who was, uh, 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 had been able to put our DMA to use, but nobody else who had it, uh, uh, with perhaps a few exceptions, uh, uh, really made anything uh, useful out of it. And Michel became sort of the apostle of the, of the uh, uh, high-resolution DMAs. He's, uh, he's uh, uh, fully devoted to science, so he spends all of his free time visiting laboratories. And he was, he would walk with his uh, little DMA or his big DMA under his arms. And thanks to him, I don't know if, if you got help uh, from him or not. Uh, he sent me the some but, standards, uh, uh, actually. But uh, um, you have to get the electrospray running. You have to get uh, 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 a number of complicated things together. And uh, it's uh, 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 his help that has made this instrument to be more used, particularly on CPC. Yeah. Uh, develop it. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, for so you've done a lot of marvelous things in your career, and but like all of us, we've had help from our colleagues, from our mentors. I want to ask you, uh, as there's a new younger crop of aerosol scientists coming up uh, through the ranks, what advice you would give them as they start their careers and as they go forward in their careers? What things have you found to be most important? Well, perhaps the, the, the most interesting developments that have come from my lab uh, have come against the wishes or against the, the dreams of the, of the PI. And so one of the recommendations I would give is listen to your advisors, uh, uh, but then make your own uh, judgment. So, uh, and if you have a great idea, don't uh, let them deter you from that. Uh, um, there is another advice, a piece of advice, uh, which the uh, young uh, need to listen to. And I learned it too late from uh, uh, a book written by uh, a famous Spanish uh, neuroscientist, uh, or, or actually uh, a neurobiologist, uh, Ramón y Cajal, who wrote a book which was called Advice to a Young Scientist. And uh, Cajal's uh, uh, life was kind of uh, interesting because he was in Spain, uh, where it was hardly any uh, scientific uh, uh, culture. And he wrote his articles in Spain, which nobody read. And so he discovered a way of, uh, of uh, seeing the neurons uh, with paints. And, uh, and of course, nobody would pay any attention. And so he carried his microscope and his, uh, and his uh, 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 painting techniques and walked to Germany and started uh, 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 visiting all kinds of laboratories until one of the great German scientists uh, sort of uh, was stunned by, and then his article into German and made him the world famous and eventually he got the Nobel Prize. So, uh, and in, in his book, <laughs> he summarized some of his advice, which in that time was how to deal with the famous German professors. And uh, it was the style of how you write your great uh, new discoveries, 
in such a way that you don't offend uh, those who came before you, but uh, or, or rather the other way around. So you sort of try to put your little contribution, even if it's great, but you present it as little in comparison with what the rest of the world has done. Uh, and it's an exercise of modesty, which turns out to be great for the career of a younger uh, person, because there is always somebody who came before you and to whom you owe debt, and you have to present your work uh, with that perspective. And that I learned a little too late <laughs> in, my, in my career, which didn't help. So, uh, Well, very wise words. <laughs> and Juan, it's been a pleasure, as always, talking with you. Thank you so much, uh, Susan. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure.